Since it first premiered in January of 1987, Unsolved Mysteries has always asked for the help of its viewers in solving real-life cases. The show has covered more than 1,300 mysteries in its multi-decade tenure as one of the longest-running programs in television history. But what many people don't know is just how successful the show's direct call to action format has actually been. With over half the cases of wanted fugitives being solved, more than 100 families being reunited as a result of the program's lost love segment, and even a handful of wrongly convicted people being exonerated and released after their stories were aired. Today, we wanted to take a look at a few examples of times when Unsolved Mysteries viewers crack cases, from tracking down fugitives, to saving innocent lives, to solving decades-old murders and disappearances. Before we get to our list, don't forget to subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest videos. With that out of the way, here are five Unsolved Mysteries cases that were solved by viewers. By all accounts, Dennis and Marilyn Depew had a rocky marriage. The couple had three children, but there was reportedly always tension in the house. According to Marilyn, Dennis had grown increasingly angry and withdrawn over the years, accusing her of turning the children against him. At the same time, he had become extremely controlling, limiting what everyone in the family was allowed to do. Marilyn told her friends she was unhappy, and after 18 years of marriage, filed for divorce. Though Dennis was granted bi-weekly visitation rights, his children were often reluctant to go with him. His control over the family reportedly continued well after the divorce. Dennis maintained an office in the family's guest house and was able to find a way to enter the main property even after Marilyn had changed the locks. On Easter Sunday, 1990, Dennis arrived to pick up two of the children. When both refused to go with him, Dennis reportedly flew into a rage, screaming at Marilyn when she tried to talk to him. He then pushed her down the stairs, beating her when she reached the bottom. When their eldest daughter ran to the neighbor's house to call for help, Dennis carried a critically injured Marilyn up the stairs, telling their other two children he was taking her to the hospital. However, they would never arrive. A search was immediately conducted. Dennis was spotted later that afternoon by a couple named Ray and Marie Thornton. As they drove past an abandoned building, they noticed a strange man in a van unloading a bloody sheet. The van later followed them down the road until they pulled off of the highway. The vehicle also had blood on the passenger side door. Concerned, they drove back to the building where they had seen the man before, discovering the bloody sheet in an animal hole nearby. The next day, Marilyn was officially declared dead when her body was found near a deserted road. She had been shot once in the back of the head. Though the search for Dennis continued, it was initially unsuccessful. That all changed on the night of March 20th, 1991, when the story was first broadcast on Unsolved Mysteries. At around 8.30 p.m., a woman in Dallas, Texas named Mary noticed that her boyfriend Hank Queen was acting strange. When she arrived home that night, he told her that he needed to leave because his mother was sick. However, he seemed to be packing much more than he needed for the trip. He also seemed to want to distract her from what he had been watching on TV, taking off shortly after in his van. Later that night, Mary received a phone call from a friend who told her that Hank was actually Dennis Depew and that she had called to report his license plate to the authorities. Dennis had likely seen the Unsolved Mysteries broadcast that night, prompting him to flee. When police tracked Dennis down, he led them on a 15-mile high-speed chase, eventually firing shots at law enforcement before turning the gun on himself. Thanks to a couple of tips from Unsolved Mysteries viewers, investigators were finally able to capture notorious murderer and sex criminal Edward Harold Bell. Though Bell's criminal record stretched back to 1969, he is best known for his violent murder of 26-year-old Texas oil worker Larry Dickens. On August 24, 1978, Larry was mowing the backyard lawn for his mother Dorothy, who he was visiting that summer. Dorothy was reportedly washing the dishes when she noticed a man pull up in front of her house in a red pickup truck. The man was Edward Harold Bell. Bell was naked from the waist down and immediately started walking over to a group of kids playing. Dorothy called the police and when Larry came inside, she told him what was going on. To prevent Bell from leaving, Larry took the keys out of his truck. Larry was then confronted by Bell, who shot him several times with a pistol when he refused to give back the keys. After staggering into the garage, Larry collapsed into his mother's arms, where he was once again shot by Bell, this time in the head. Larry then stumbled forward and fell onto the driveway. 
After Bell had recovered his keys, he went back to his truck, this time returning with a rifle which he shot Larry with several more times. Bell was later arrested after a high-speed chase with police. Despite his shockingly violent crime, he was granted bail two months after his arrest. He never showed up for his hearing and would remain on the run for the next 15 years. Edward Harold Bell was arrested in Panama City just three months after the original broadcast of the Unsolved Mysteries segment about the murder of Larry Dickens. He was extradited back to the United States where he was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to 70 years in prison. Disturbingly, Bell may have been responsible for several other murders in the 1970s and would later make several chilling prison confessions about other alleged victims. Though he was sadly never charged in connection with any of these crimes, he would at least spend the rest of his life in prison, dying in Texas's Wallace Pack unit in April of 2019. Alex Cooper was a beloved father and grandfather who lived in Cranbrook, British Columbia with his wife Margaret. The 65-year-old was an accomplished musician, enjoyed fishing, and was known by all as a family man. On the morning of April 4, 1987, Alex's daughter Leela and her husband Pete were driving home from a shopping trip when they noticed his car parked near the side of the road next to a bridge. Assuming he was down by the water, the couple went to talk to Alex, but could find no trace of him. Concerned because of her father's heart condition, Leela called her mother, worried that her dad might have had a heart attack while fishing and fallen into the water. Even more alarmingly, Margaret said that she had not heard from Alex in over 24 hours. A search of the local hospitals also failed to turn up any sign of Alex. There was nothing suspicious found in his car, and the vehicle had been left locked. Investigators soon discovered that Alex had eaten lunch on the day of his disappearance less than a mile from where his car was discovered. This led the family to suspect that Alex also could have been killed in a robbery gone wrong. According to Margaret, Alex frequently paid for things using large rolls of cash, and she worried that on that particular day, her husband might have attracted unwanted attention. However, additional witnesses also described seeing a man matching Alex's description hitchhiking in the area on the day he went missing, leading some investigators to believe that Alex had disappeared willingly. The family rejected this idea on the grounds that he had left both his heart medication and credit cards at home. It would take more than a year for the bizarre truth to begin to unravel. When Margaret petitioned the provincial Supreme Court to have her husband legally declared dead, she discovered that there was no birth certificate issued in Alex's name. In fact, there was no record of Alex Cooper existing at all before their marriage in 1952. It seemed that Alex had intentionally tried to hide his past from his family. Four years later, a man named David Cooper was reported missing in Toronto. The man had lived in a boarding house for approximately a year, where he worked as a traveling salesman. A friend had filed the report when David had been slow to return from a business trip, assuming something was the matter. When the police searched the man's apartment, they discovered a photograph that was a match to Alex Cooper. It turned out that David Cooper was yet another one of the missing man's pseudonyms. However, after discovering that police had been to his apartment, he once again vanished. When the Unsolved Mysteries segment about the case first aired in September of 1991, a viewer in Hamilton, Ontario, recognized the elusive Alex Cooper and contacted the police. A few months later, he was finally reunited with his family, and the rest of the story came out at long last. Alex Cooper's real name was Albin Arsenal. In 1948, at the age of 26, he was falsely accused of robbing an office of the Union Pacific Railroad where he worked as an employee at the time. Not wanting to be arrested for a crime he didn't commit, Albin changed his name to Alex Cooper and fled. He married Margaret four years later and was able to live a completely normal life until his 65th birthday, after which he needed to submit a birth certificate to receive his pension. Because he was living under a false identity, he knew he could not do this, and unable to bring himself to tell his family the truth, he decided to once again go on the run. Sadly, Albin had no idea that the charges against him had likely been dropped years earlier, making the whole ordeal entirely unnecessary. Thankfully though, he was able to reconcile with his family, living another 15 years before passing away in 2007. In July of 1989, Patricia and David Stallings took their three-month-old son Ryan to the hospital after he became extremely sick. Ryan had experienced serious gastric distress since birth, but now his breathing was labored and he was vomiting uncontrollably. 
Ryan was placed in intensive care where he began showing signs of improvement. But after running some tests, doctors began to grow suspicious of the couple. They told David and Patricia that their son's blood samples revealed the presence of ethylene glycol and acetone. The two substances are poisonous if consumed and can be found most commonly in the household products antifreeze and nail polish. Patricia and David admitted that they had both substances at their home. This led the doctors to suspect that one of the parents had poisoned their son and an investigation soon began. When Ryan was released from hospital 12 days later, he was placed into foster care. David and Patricia were only allowed weekly supervised visits with their son, but for a time Ryan remained healthy. However, on the sixth week, three days after the parents had visited, the young boy once again experienced another episode of severe vomiting. At the hospital, he was once again diagnosed with ethylene glycol poisoning. In the minds of investigators, this all but confirmed that Patricia Stallings was the one behind the poisonings. During her visit, she had briefly been left alone with Ryan, and they concluded she must have used this very small window of time to administer the poisoning. Patricia was charged with assault and was forbidden from seeing her son. Sadly, Ryan's condition only grew worse and he was taken off life support on September 7th before reaching the age of six months. Patricia's charges were upgraded to first degree murder and she was barred from attending the funeral. A few weeks later, she learned that she was pregnant for a second time and when her son DJ was born in the winter of 1990, David was also denied custody despite not being a suspect in the crime. Interestingly, DJ also mysteriously developed similar symptoms to Ryan's when he was just two weeks old. This time, however, the child was diagnosed with a rare genetic condition called methamalonic acidemia, or MMA. The condition often presents with symptoms similar to ethylene glycol poisoning and can often be confused by doctors. Despite this revelation, Patricia's defense team presented no medical expert witnesses at trial, and the information about DJ's diagnosis was ruled inadmissible. Patricia was convicted of her son's murder on March 4, 1991, and sentenced to life in prison. When a segment covering the case aired later that year on Unsolved Mysteries, many doctors familiar with MMA called the show's telecenter, offering to help with Patricia's appeal. This resulted first in Patricia receiving a new trial, and then a dismissal of the charges altogether when tests conclusively proved Ryan had died of MMA. In October of 1991, three months after Patricia was released from prison, DJ was returned to her and David, and their family was officially reunited. The Stallings would later go on to sue the labs that had incorrectly diagnosed Ryan with ethylene glycol poisoning, eventually being awarded $7 million. In February of 1993, Unsolved Mysteries aired a segment about a man named Newell Sessions and the mystery surrounding an item he had been given by a friend years earlier. The friend was referred to by the fictitious name Gabby for the broadcast, and the segment explained that in 1986, he left several possessions with Newell before moving away. Among the items was an antique trunk. The trunk remained locked for six years until curiosity finally got the better of Newell, and he decided to open it. When he did, he made a shocking discovery. Inside was most of a human skeleton. Still more disturbing, there was a bullet lodged in the skull. Before calling police, Newell called Gabby and asked him what he knew about the human remains. According to Newell, Gabby appeared just as surprised as he was to learn about the trunk's contents and claimed to have bought the item at a garage sale, though he said he could not remember the time or place that he had acquired it. He also said that he had never looked in the trunk because he didn't have the proper tools to open it. Further investigation into the trunk and its contents revealed that it had been made sometime in the 1930s and may have been used by someone in the U.S. Army between World War I and World War II. A plastic bag from the supermarket chain High vs was also found in the trunk. These were first manufactured in the early 1950s. Analysis of the skeleton showed that they were of a Caucasian male in his 50s or 60s who had stood about 5 foot 8 inches tall. In March of 1992, the bones were turned over to the Wyoming State Crime Lab, who created a facial reconstruction of the man that was featured in the Unsolved Mysteries broadcast. Despite being one of the show's most popular cases, it would be more than two decades before someone with the right knowledge would come forward. However, in October of 2017, investigators finally caught a lucky break when a woman named Shelley said that she thought she could identify the remains. After seeing a re-airing of the episode of Unsolved Mysteries, she believed the bones might belong to her grandfather, Joseph J. Mulvaney. Mulvaney was born in 1923 and had served in the U.S. Army during the interwar period. He had gone missing in 1960. She believed the culprit behind her grandfather's death was her great uncle, a man named John David Morris. Morris was the person who had been given the nickname Gabby for the Unsolved Mysteries broadcast. 
A DNA test confirmed that the skeletal remains indeed belonged to Joseph Mulvaney. It is believed that Morris murdered Mulvaney in 1960, burying the remains for some time. When he had to move for work, he dug the trunk back up before eventually giving it to Newell Sessions. Morris later committed suicide in Mississippi. Mulvaney's remains were eventually returned to his family, after which a military memorial service was held for him in 2019. That brings us to the end of our list. Are there any unsolved mysteries cases that were solved by viewers that you think we missed? Let us know in the comments section below, and we'll consider them for a future video. As always, if you enjoyed our list, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest videos. Thank you for watching.